Bienvenido, familia. Es un placer estar aquí con ustedes. Um, I'm hoping that this will be an interactive invitation to think about how intersectionality could enhance your next research proposal. Um, <clears throat> so one of the things that I wanted to focus on today is the census because of the timeliness, right? We all know that this only happens once every 10 years. I'm also going to show some examples of how I've used intersectionality in two of my research areas, health and education. And then really, I'm hoping that the majority of the time will be spent in a dialogue because, again, this is an invitation to develop a new vision as an analytical tool and also as a tool for um, action and reflection. So I'll start off by talking a little bit about the Census 2020 and why we need an intersectional lens for understanding the use of race and ethnic data, especially in Latinx communities, which is part of what I do research on. And then um, what is the civil rights use of that, right? And I'll pose this question to each of you to think about, because I imagine many of you, even if you're not in the social sciences, use um, race and ethnicity uh, data. Are we post-racial? Who benefits when we have data collection systems that are power evasive and um, color evasive, right? What would ethical data collection look like? Should we use one question to measure two concepts, race and origin? How would you measure um, the following? Would you use one question to measure someone's gender and sexual orientation or their educational attainment and their occupational status? What about income and wealth? One question. What's the census afraid of? Why do we need ethical accuracy? It's useful to think of race as street race. So this is going to be a common theme. A social status that is not equivalent to origin culture, ancestry, or even your DNA markers. Let's be clear, right? It's a social status, just like gender, that is usually based on meanings that are ascribed to you based on what you look like in a particular context. So I always talk about um, Kamara Jones, who's a medical doctor, epidemiologist, African-American um, trailblazer in this field. And I don't want to take credit for street race. It really is her work, and, and along with other health disparities researchers, that got me to think about framing the issue this way. And what she says is, I'm, she's African-American, and she says, I can be in three different countries, from Brazil to Latin America to the United States, and nothing in my DNA has changed. My physical appearance hasn't changed, but her social status has changed. Not only that, but the embodied social climate that would predict her health outcomes has changed, right? And so, again, this is such a big takeaway. Race is a social construction that is unique to a particular context. And I think the criticism I've received from this concept that just asks, if you were walking down the street, what race do you think other Americans who do not know you would automatically assume you were based on what you look like is, well, it'll change everywhere. But that's the point. That's the point. So anyway, um, ooh, this bullet is probably one of my favorite ones, too, because we never talk about class, right? But I think you all heard recently the SAT has decided that they're going to create an adversity score <laughs> that is based on your zip code as a proxy for disadvantage. I want us to think about what that means. It's a good intention. But in practice, what will that mean? And who benefits from that? So I just want to make sure everyone knows that 10, 11 years ago now, we started the Institute for the Study of Race and Social Justice. And we have the first graduate certificate as of 2016 that's interdisciplinary. And I invite you to share the, the uh, information with everyone. It's actually open to community, so you don't have to be enrolled. And we just started our undergraduate version this, starting this fall. And we run on donations. We have no dedicated funding. So please go to race.unm.edu and donate um, your time, your energy, et cetera. So intersectionality, a very basic definition, comes from Silma um, Bilge and, and Patricia Hill Collins. And I'm not going to read the entire quote, but it basically says that if we want to understand inequalities, we need to understand that it's complicated and that we cannot look at one axis of inequality in isolation from another. So um, it's better if we develop this new vision, this invitation for a new vision that looks at how many axes of inequality work together. And that intersectionality is not only critical inquiry, but it's also praxis. It is about social justice. Um, so do you have critical inquiry and in, in praxis? I also want to mention a course that I 
taught this last um, fall intercession. I will be offering again the week after finals for any of you that might be interested. It is uh, available for undergraduate and graduate credit. And again, the idea is interdisciplinary work that helps us advance policy. This is a beautiful quote that comes from a recent publication in Gender and Society by two of my most esteemed um, founding sociologists, actually the second um, U.S.-born Latina to earn doctorates in sociology, Maxine Bakazin, who earned her master's degree here and just donated a chair in our department, and then one of my mentors, Ruth Sambrana, who wrote to Toxic Ivory Towers and the Health Consequences of Racism for Underrepresented Minority Faculty. And they're practicing intersectionality by saying, you know, this concept that we use called women of color, it ironically and paradoxically homogenizes very different experiences. And we have to be careful of that. That is self-reflexivity that says, in Baka Zinn, I remember being a graduate student and reading her book, Women of Color, in the US and thinking, wow, she's critiquing her own work by saying, if we use that term, be aware that we might be homogenizing an experience that is radically different. The Kwambi River Collective also talks about the importance of self-reflexivity, right? Being critical of your social location and making sure that we are open to being self-critical. Um, here is the visual that I often use in many venues to get all of you, to invite you all to locate you, yourselves in systems of inequality. I'm gonna start with the less obvious one, social class. We often think of just income data as the only one that we're interested in, but what about wealth? What about your parental educational attainment background? If I were to ask right now, how many of us grew up in households where no one had a college degree, I imagine that only two or three of us would be raising our hands. I may be wrong, maybe four of us. But the idea is that this is data that we often don't collect. What about your partner status? What about your net worth, your social networks, your social honor? I also want us to think about age as another stratifying um, axis of inequality, disability status, body embodiment, partner status, parental status, caregiver status, and gender sexual orientation. I'm not gonna spend much time on that last corner because that's the whole point of my talk, but the idea is that in most of our data collection, we flatten all of those things when they're not equivalent. They're not interchangeable. They actually require different questions for us to understand the complexity. I want you to look at the red lettering on the side which says, we didn't create these systems of inequality. I didn't create capitalism, racism, and, and all these things that are oppressing, but I'm implicated within them. And so the way I use this tool um, is thinking about my cousin who also grew up in a household where no one had a college education. My parents had a second grade education, immigrants from the Dominican Republic who did not speak English as their language, right? We grew up in public housing in New York in the 1970s. And although we're both black Latinos, right? Afro-Latinos visibly um, would be racialized as black. My cousin was much darker skinned than I was. My cousin was always gender non-conforming. And by adulthood, um, visibly transgender. And they are no longer with us. So thinking about the social climate and even though we went to the same kinds of um, high school, uh, public schools, et cetera, in New York City in the 70s, the ways in which their social location differed from mine were tremendous. And for me not to be critical of that and understand that the social determinants of their health was completely different than mine, it means that I am not being intersectional or self-critical. I just use this quote to again invite you to do the same for yourselves because here's an unsolicited email from someone who attended a very similar talk that I gave. It was a group of health disparities um, researchers. And she talks about how, you know, as someone whose street race is white but has a grandmother who immigrated from Latin America, it made me think a lot about my own journey and understanding my relationship to race and ethnicity. It's something that I'm beginning to grapple with and it has caused a fair amount of discomfort as well as excitement. I was wondering if you had any book, a recommendation for someone who just started this. This is the kind of attitude that we need in order to engage in critical self-reflexivity. The fact that she embraced that discomfort and said, instead of saying, I feel uncomfortable, you're calling me a racist, you're saying I'm not Latina, <laughs> you're saying that um, I don't belong because I look white, she said, I'm going to use this as an opportunity to learn more so that I can advance social justice. And I think that this is the attitude that will really get us far.
I want you to think about these questions as we get towards the end. What's your own street race? What's the historical context? What's your reaction to how a person in a position of power um, defines your race on the street? What about street gender? I talked about my cousin. They would not be classified as man or woman. They were visibly transgender. Um, would not be classified in any of those categories, right? And social class. And how does this critical, ongoing, self-implicating reflection on the simultaneity of all these systems of inequality, whether it's citizenship, status, disability, um, shape your understanding of complex inequalities? Think about that. This is an invitation. I want to share this <laughs> email, which is much longer. And it was a response from a program officer at a very prestigious funding agency that will remain nameless. <laughs> And their response was when I approached that program officer um, for funding for research on health disparities, that intersectionality was a stand-in for analytical laziness. Perhaps a better way to approach this, and then berates me and says, well, you, haven't read, you haven't done your work, would be to focus on race or gender or class. There are plenty of poor white men and women who suffer from serious health consequences. So again, Attention to the politics of knowledge production, right? Whose knowledge is going to be seen as legitimate and whose knowledge is going to be seen... What year was this, Nancy? I would say it was 2016 or so. Not that long ago, four years ago, maybe five. So I want you to understand that when I speak to the only three women in 114 years have been elected as presidents of the American Sociological Association, all of them trailblazing intersectional scholars in their own right, Patricia Hill Collins, Evelyn Acano Glenn, and now most recently with New Mexican Roots, Mary Romero. They tell me they get similar responses to their work. And this is not unique. I talk to younger colleagues who tell me that this is the response that they get. All right, so losing self-reflexivity represents a sure sign that one is beginning to sell out. I was just going to give you two more examples Please. of what you And I want about. this to be interactive. Yeah. Yeah. So, so definitely, I've been told that intersectionality is over. <laughs> yes. Really? And um, so just, just to... it's lazy. Uh, last month, I was at a deco decoloniality summer school. And uh, so folks from Latin America were leading this summer school in South Africa. Oh, yeah. And I spent the whole week arguing with the leaders about the validity of intersectionality. Wow. They uh, reduced it to um, oppression Olympics. <gasps> and I'm like, okay, if you're coming at it from a white feminist perspective, maybe. But this is how I'm coming at it. And just spent the whole week arguing with them about it. So decoloniality. So lack of self-reflexivity again, because had these individuals located themselves in systems of inequality, they might come to different conclusions as some of the people that I'm going to share with you. Yes? Uh, such resistance to look in this combinatory data. I mean, coming from a STEM field, if you look in any gender equity report, for example, yes. uh, whether like from societies, different societies like SPA or APS produce them, in none of them there are any intersectional data. I know. So why it, would people view that it's something like of the past, like she's saying? I think it involves people... Um, deeply thinking about their intersectional social locations and being uncomfortable about it, but it also involves challenges to what has passed as knowledge prior to this lens of inequality. So it makes people very uncomfortable. And it is, I mean, I'm going to talk a little bit more about critical race theory. It is about power, and it's about racialized power and its intersections with many other um, dimensions. So I just want to share with you one of the conceptual models that I think brings home the point that when we're collecting race data, we should ask ourselves a first order question. What part of the social construction of race am I collecting? Am I just simply asking what is the de facto gold standard, which is how do you identify yourself? That's an interesting question, but we know that if we're looking at issues of discrimination, it has more to do with how others see you in a particular context. So Ascribed race, it's been called. I call it street race. Kamara Jones calls it socially assigned race. Um, Clarence Gravely, anthropologist, calls it folk race. The point is getting to that dimension of race. What about your lived race, gender experiences, and life course embodiment? That other part is something that um, 
David Williams, also a medical sociologist, has um, developed an everyday racism scale. But how can we develop a scale that reflects the lived realities of women of color? So one of the um, critiques or maybe ways of enhancing and building on that work is by saying, are these everyday scales really based on men's experiences and which men, right? Um, political status and tribal status, again, a different dimension. We understand the histories of settler colonialism has meant that this is a different experience than all of those circles, right? So what um, ethnicity matters. So I don't want anyone to walk away and say, well, we're just talking about race and we're saying, you know, your cultural background, your language background, your ancestry, national origin, none of that matters, your generational. Of course it does. I mentioned my parents, right, who came with a second grade education. Um, they're educational opportunity structures look totally different than my uh, sisters and I. Even though we grew up in segregated housing and went to public schools that were de facto segregated, radically different, right? So to lump Latinos all by generational status, very, very um, problematic. But we do need to collect this data. It's just don't flatten it. The same is true for sex assigned at birth, gender, gender identity, what I call street gender. Um, Again, this is just a visual for you to think about why zip code is not enough. You would think this is the Lower East Side in New York City, and you would think that um, these uh, apartment buildings are in totally different neighborhoods. They're across the street from each other. And you can find that here in Albuquerque, you will see a $700,000 home across the street from a trailer park. So this is why it is a good intention, right? The SAT adversity score. But that capturing the social networks, the social capital, the cultural capital, that youth growing up here, who until the 1980s, visible minorities were not allowed to purchase homes there, right? These are co-ops, and this is public housing. Think about the net worth of those the second and third generation, the generation. So what are the limits? Why not just use class more, uh, origin as measured by parental educational attainment? And of course, we'd love to get um, wealth data, but that may not be possible. This is a visual that really represents one of the biggest gifts to intersectional theory and concepts and thought, and that is the matrix of domination in Patricia Hill Collins' Black Feminist Thought, where she talks about the importance of understanding a particular matrix of domination and how that is comprised of these systems of inequality. So if we're thinking about South Africa, as Dr. Sarai mentioned, or here in Nuevo Mexico or New York City, there's a particular matrix and history there of white supremacy, um, heteropatriarchy, uh, nationalism, et cetera. But then within that matrix, then power is organized very differently. So when you think about the university, right? Who sits in positions of um, institutional organizational power? Who's in the position of making um, rules of the game regarding tenure and promotion and hiring? And then what are the different lived experiences that accompany each of those um, uh, contexts? And then I think the most important domain of power that Patricia Hill Collins refers to is the ideological domain of power, the narratives that serve as the glue for the status quo or whatever the particular arrangement of power is. I would also highly recommend reading um, Crenshaw's configurations of uh, intersectionality, political, um, structural, and representational, and McCall's complex inequality. So these are all um, huge gifts. <laughs> There's so much we could spend you know, forever. The tenets of critical race theory I was going to jump into before I talk about the studies. Yeah. yeah. Just, so. <clears throat> Lately, or recently, there was a young man who could not graduate because of his hair. And the people who did um, the movie Hair or something won an Oscar. They brought him to the, to the Oscars with them. And someone posted that on Facebook. I shared a couple of them. And the first thing people like to say that got me reminding when you said that it permeates all is, well, if he would just follow the rules. Of course. But the rules were made. Right. <laughs> OK. <laughs> it's, it's just, right. it's, so but that's the argument that they put forth. Right. And it's just. I hate fighting with people online I don't know, but I just... You have to be more like us. <sighs> I know that. I, I, know, I, know, I know what they're saying. <laughs> right, No right, white right. boy has hair down there. Just, you know, the black boys and the natives. So it's right. like, what? This, but yeah. That's a great uh, illustration of how hegemony works, how 
Dominant ideologies permeate not only the organizational arrangements, but also the rules of the game and your consciousness. So that's a great example. So these are the tenets of critical race theory. And I recently came back from speaking on a panel on intersectionality and methods at the University of Berlin. They just started a master's program on gender intersectionality and politics. And the perpetual question was, you know, well, can we have intersectionality that doesn't center race, right? Like, can we just use it as a tool and not necessarily understand the primacy and the centrality of um, racial domination? And the answer from the keynote that was given on the first night was no. You, you need to have both. You cannot be intersectional and not understand critical race theory. And you can't be a critical race theorist unless you're intersectional. So both and, right? And so that's an incredibly important point that I want us to think about. A lot of people like to um, pretend that these are separate camps. No, they're inseparable. So I want you to think about yes. the idea. Those of us who are in STEM disciplines give a good definition of what critical race theory is. So it's a critical approach to um, understanding racial domination and why we've made so little progress in spite of the gains of the civil rights. So it really grew out of a social movement in the law school. Kimberly Crenshaw was a huge part of that. And if anyone's interested in doing studies there, I would recommend UCLA because they have an, an intensive program on critical race theory in the law school. But we have our own critical race theorists here in our law school, and I want us not to forget. But it's this idea of the permanence and centrality of racism and how we need to understand that um, liberal democracy and racism are inherently mutually reinforcing. I just want to, can I just give my version? Please. Um, so I think, and, and it'll be interesting to see if you agree. So I think, for me, the idea is that what most people walking, walking around think race is, is actually the product of a particular set of historical and social institutions and concepts. So there's nothing inherently about me that is a race, but rather it's a system of power, as you would say, that is ascribing a certain set of features or attributes to me. And for me, when I do critical race theory, what I'm doing is I am analyzing those institutions and those concepts and those categories and language that turn me into somebody who has a race. So it's denaturalizing. It's denaturalizing the idea of race as like some kind of thing that we all possess. Mm -hmm. So right? this. So I think that it doesn't. I mean, you're you're very much talking about it as racism, but Anthony Appiah, wh whom I adore, distinguishes between racialism and racism. Like to racialize somebody is to categorize them as a member of like a racialized group without necessarily saying that they're inferior or disadvantaged or something. So the mere act of racializing somebody is what critical race theory wants to get behind. I think right? critical race theorists are a little bit um, more interested in this definition. And maybe what we'll, I'll do is save the questions. I do have a, like 80 PowerPoint <laughs> slides right, to right, show right, you. Right, right. But save those questions because I, want, I think this is um, very relevant. It's the idea that colorblindness is not anti-racism. This comes from Eduardo Bonilla Silva, um, who is a critical race theorist in sociology. And he says, it begins with the understanding the institutional nature of racial matters and accepting that everyone, everyone, no one is not racialized in a racialized society. And that you're affected materially by that. You cannot say, right. I'm not, I have, do not possess a gender or a race or a class or a sexual orientation. You are located in those systems. You may not have created them, and that you're affected by it. Right. Right? Your life chances, your um, experiences, um, in some cases, is life or death, right? right? And that you're affected ideologically by that structure. Right. Let me back up, because racial formation theory was something that Felipe mentioned that I also subscribe to and I absolutely love. And I always joke, why don't they provide visuals, right? So the census is a perfect example of a place where we can examine what are the definitions, interpretations, and representations of racial dynamics, and how is that tied to the allocation of resources? So you all know that the citizenship question that was proposed for the 2020 census has been taken off by um, decision of the Supreme Court. The 
mere idea that you were going to include in the decennial census, which is used for voting redistricting and all these civil rights outcomes that we care about, was going to contain a citizenship question, on the face looks innocent, right? No. As a critical race theorist and as a racial formation theorist, you would say that is the definition of a racist racial project. Why? Because it actually replicates the idea that you're, not, you're going to reduce the amount of resources for the most marginalized communities, even though on the face it looks like you are just trying to collect data, right? For, <laughs> and talk about re-articulation for the purposes of civil rights enforcement when none, no one from the civil rights community wanted that, right? So how will you me message the urgency of a complete count? This is a civil rights issue, right? Don't let anyone rob you of your rights. We have a right to be counted. The citizenship question has been removed. Do you want someone knocking on your door? The census is private, confidential, and secure. If a census worker reveals your data, sub they're subjected to five years in prison and a, a fine of $250,000, and that data only become publicly available in 2092, 72 years later, right? The unit of analysis is the living quarters. Dorms, jails, and hospitals are counted as group quarters, and there is a question about whether or not that data will be reported, the demographic data, the age, the race, the gender, um, to the census um, because of concerns about privacy. But the idea that that data are not available for 72 years should preclude any possibility because, again, these numbers are used to look at voting rights, resources, representation issues, so if we are not reporting demographic data, and I'm gonna only ask you to hold the questions because okay. literally I won't get to the studies okay. if you don't mind, then we may be in a situation where we are undermining the whole civil rights use, right? Because this is used to determine representation in Congress. So as you know, the first time in the history of the country we're gonna have an internet-based <laughs> survey that of course if people don't offer, they will get, they will, um, get a paper copy, they can always call in their answers. There will be language interpreters. So the um, census begins in mid-March and ends sometime in July. They'll never tell you the exact day. But if we miss anybody, we're going to have to live with those numbers for 10 years. That has been removed, as you know. It is on the American Community Survey, and no one should confuse the decennial with that. That survey happens annually. It's 3.5 million households, and it has a, and a plethora of demographic questions. Um, so. I mentioned that my most cited <laughs> piece is an essay I wrote, a public sociology piece for theconversation.com that says the Census Bureau keeps confusing race and ethnicity. This is what you are going to get in the mail or uh, you can fill online. So the first question I'm going to say, yes, I'm Hispanic, I'm Dominican. My daughters are Chicana, Dominicanas, etc., Nuevo Mexicanas. What is their race? So for the first time in the history of the census, we are actually asking two questions in one question. We're asking, what is their race? And then write their origin. So I ask the census um, constantly. I say, what box, what race box would you put Canadian? What about South African? What about American? Nationalities and race should never be coupled. That is the definition of racism. To pretend, I just came back from Berlin, as I said, there is a huge black community there. There are Latinx uh, um, Germans. So to say, oh no, white is German, is absolutely problematic, and it could lead to eugenicist racist projects. Um, despite the good intentions. The American Community Survey has a question on ancestry. If they really wanted to add ancestry or nationality or origin, they could have done that. But instead, we have this. And what are the consequences? Who benefits when we have power and color evasive data, right? Um, this is a picture that I often show that shows that most people, when they think of a Hispanic person, they think of someone who's not necessarily white or black, but we know anybody in this room could be Hispanic, right? And that we all occupy different racial statuses, right, um, as a social um, construction. We also know that there's a huge dismissal of the plethora of social science research that shows there is a color line, especially in Latino communities, in terms of voting rights. Who gets asked for extra pop, um, papers when they go vote? What about in terms of employment, where the, the income disparities are, even at the same level of education? What about in health access? Like Thomas Lavis wrote a beautiful article, are black Hispanics more like blacks or Hispanics? He finds both, right? In terms of treatment and access, we're treated like blacks. But in terms of cultural practices and food ways, we probably eat the same things that our white-looking Latino um, brothers and sisters eat, right? 
And so how will your research collect data on the color line and the opportunity structure in Latinx community? Are you going to interrogate these inequalities? And that question I put at the bottom is, should we file a complaint with the Government Office of Accountability on the Hill before the research protocols are finalized for the 2030 census? Because I kid you not, there were two tests that happened for the census 2020. One was the, Ameri um, uh, gosh, 2010 and 2015 residential segregation, zero. And so I asked myself, are we post-racial? Um, Turner did this study that looked at um, sending 8,000 people knocking on doors, and they found it wasn't necessarily those who had an accent or who spoke a different language or had a so-called funny-looking name. It was the minute you showed up at the door. H Hogan did a study where he used American Community Survey data and said, do white Latinos have this, live in neighborhoods with the same level of poverty as brown and black Latinos? Nope. No, nope, we don't. No, we do not. Um, criminal justice, committing the same crime. How are we sentenced? There's a color line. But we're going to dismiss all this data. We're just going to ask people how they feel. And that's, that's all we need. And check 15 boxes, because if that happens, we have no meaningful data on the color line. So keep in mind, until 1960, just before I was born, <laughs> there was a question that said, what is your race or color? And then magically it disappeared in 1970, because we're post-racial, now color doesn't matter. If you erase the data infrastructure on the color line, then you have no grounds for claiming that there is an injustice. You can just become colorblind, right? So look at these handsome men. I show them quite often, David Ortiz, Dominicano, Ricky Martin, Puerto Ricano, and of course, George Lopez. Uh, Mexicano. I have cousins that look like all of them. And, and Ricky is not that light. I mean, he's tan, right? But he would not be racialized as black. He certainly probably would not experience the profiling that happens on the border or anywhere where someone that looks more like George Lopez will be asked, hey, do you have papers? Where, are you really from the United States, et cetera? So family members of the same ethnicity can and should mark that race question differently to reflect their own uh, street race. There's nothing, that is not saying they're not Latino, it's simply recognizing that their racial statuses um, are predicted to mean different things. A lot of people say, but I'm mixed race, what should I mark? My children are mixed race, et cetera. Well, so are these very beautiful women, right? But the bottom line is, they could put 15 things if they want. Based on what they look like, we're predicted to find out who is probably an AP, who's probably in the school to prison pipeline, who is going to probably be asked for more documentation, et cetera, et cetera. So why would it be important to mark one box for the race question? This is not your ancestry. Obama was chided for, mar for marking one box. People accused him of denying his mother and all kinds of things. You know, he should have checked two boxes. But Obama knows that when he's trying to catch a cab or when he's um, going to look for an apartment, chances are that his experiences are going to look, even though he would be considered a light-skinned um, black person, he's still black. Still black man. That's right. Oh boy, this is bad, because that means I've been speaking for 40 minutes. Not good. And I, and I haven't even shared with you the health study and the education study, which I still do want to share, so I will continue. This is going to share with you that this episode involved a reporter from Univision, black Colombian immigrant woman, who called and said, a woman of color is coming to interview, a Latina woman of color, but when my sister showed up, she, her life was threatened because I'm assuming that in his imagination, this was a member of the KKK, she was a light-skinned Latina, right? And he was fine with that, but when she showed up, her life was threatened. Most of the kids in cages, right, all over, probably are brown-skinned kids. We have no way of capturing that. We have no brown category. And previously, I mentioned that 90% of enslaved Africans ended up in the Caribbean and Latin America, but only 3% of US Latinos identify as black. The same is true for native or brown, right? There is no brown category. There is no brown. We have no way of capturing institutional data on this experience. This is how Latinos answered the race question in 2010. 85% of Cubans answered white, only 30% of Dominicans, but two thirds of South, of South Americans answered white and half of Puerto Ricans and Mexicans. Not data that um, is often shared. No, no. Anti-blackness is a real thing in our communities. We know that. 
So we know that there's civil rights use. That's why we need not to conflate. What is your racial ontology? How do you conceptualize race? And what implications does that have for the social structure, right? Race is not ethnicity, nationality. It, like gender, is a social status. Um, all right, this is just giving you the history of colorblindness in the census and how they're dismantling. Every year there is a bill that's introduced by Republican senators and representatives to erase any data collection on race and to um, uh, delete non-citizens from apportionment. So this is a part of a long-term um, effort to repeal the gains of the civil rights. Uh, what is apportionment? For deciding whether or not, so California stands to lose a seat now with the census. Our neighboring state, Texas, is spending zero dollars on a complete count, right? I have ideas about how we could collect a race data in a more meaningful way, but let's switch quickly, right? Because I, I said I was going to share some examples. So this was a national survey that was conducted through the Robert Wood Johnson Center for Health Policy um, that was recently sunset here. And it was published in the Sociology of Race and Ethnicity that used this measure of street race. Um, and basically, we find that when we use that measure to understand discrimination, those that are um, saying that their street race is black or Arab reported, and these are all Latinos, nationally representative sample, that they had the highest experiences of um, discrimination in stores, with police, when they went um, looking for homes, et cetera, et cetera. I have many qualitative studies of my own experiences of pregnant while black, and some of the comments that were made um, to me, not only while I was you know, accessing healthcare, but just entering my building here in uh, Albuquerque where I'm being told I can't come in because I don't belong there. And I'm like, well, what makes you think I don't belong here? Oh, I thought you didn't live here. Um, being told that one of my daughters had an African gene and that accounted for her. I mean, all kinds of things. So it raises a question, what is being taught in, in the health professions about race? Um, this was the book that was the product of an NIH grant that includes that chapter, Contextualizing Lived Race, Gender, and the Racialized Social Determinants of Health. Um, I talk about lived race gender as inseparable. That's a very intersectional con conceptualization. And that the pathways of embodiment, like I mentioned, my cousin were very different for their health outcomes in my own. So this was a street race paper. And it says, if we use these three measures, so this is what we usually just ask on a survey. How do you identify? Of those 1,500 Latinos that answered, half are going to say, almost half, I'm white. But when you ask them a scribed white, which is Kamara Jones's question, how do people usually classify you in the United States? That number jumps down. It's only 14%. And when we asked the street race question, it was 22%. And this is just a distribution of, according to the street race question, how would they answer, oh, 46% said I'm seen as Latino, only 4% I'm seen as black. Keep in mind, this was a predominantly Mexican sample. If it were in New York City, that number would look totally different, <laughs> um, Arab and Mexican. So we predicted that there were going to be differences in mental health outcomes and physical health outcomes. You know, like, is your health good or bad? Um, and then we controlled for uh, several things. So we found that for physical health, street race wasn't the best predictor. It was their self. Um, identified race, so people who said, I, I identify as white, said that their health was the best, right? Their physical health. But for mental health, for mental health, street race was the predictor. And so it, it raises the question, if you report on the street, I think people see me as white, your odds of having good mental health were the best, right? And these are all Latino people. Uh, Mexicans were less likely to report optimal he health in terms of their um, physical health. And those who said, I think on the, the street I'm seen as um, Middle Eastern Arab. Um, Mexican women were less likely to report optimal health. Latino males were, so, so again, we can't just lump Latinos. We need to look at all of these differences. This is a, the question on street gender that was actually included in a survey we did here locally. Um, the New Mexico Social Determinants of Health, but of course to have sufficient numbers to do statistical analysis is a challenge. This was the BRFIS, the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance Survey that Dr. Edward um, Vargas, who's now at ASU and used to be a postdoc here, um, was able to look at. Here in Nuevo Mexico in 2002, the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance had a, um, a unit that asked, 
how do you others socially classify you? So for whites, there was no difference practically, right? 98% of whites said, yeah, I think uh, um, people socially classify me as white. Well, look at the multiracial. More than half of multiracial people said, I'm the, I think people socially ascribe me as white. Um, for some other race, which is predominantly Hispanic, a third, for people who said, I think my race is Hispanic, 15% said, I think you know, others see me as white. And for Native, it was 6% only. For if, but if you said, I'm black or I'm Asian, nobody said, I think others see me as white. <laughs> And this is in New Mexico. So what are the implications for these um, for data collection? We need more than one measure of race. Um, look at this cost of not having more than one measure. So this came out in 2011, I want to say. Oh, 2012. And the conclusion of this um, study of mortality was that Latina women had the highest life expectancy of any group. And I'm thinking, let's look at that intersectionally, because clearly that is not possible. Um, when we look at women that are probably racialized as black and brown, I, I bet those numbers would change. But we have no way of capturing that. I now, before we end, want to talk a little bit about the intersectional analysis is on the back of your flyer <laughs> um, for the, the course. If anyone doesn't have it, the numbers are pretty small, so you may not be able to look at it. Sure. On, um, on race identification or street race because the cultural component, the giant component is like a hot part that may, uh, uh, may influence the data. The data, yeah. yeah because, for example, like meat eating versus vegetable eating or... That's a good question, and that wasn't my study, but I just raised the question, if we did intersectional analysis, would we have different results, right? If we were looking at the life expectancy by using something like street race and class and gender. But hold that thought, and I'm going to just finish the education piece. So how can we leverage um, intersectional data for looking at inequalities? So this was a, another study that you have a copy of the main um, result that I wanted to share with you, making the invisible visible, looking at race, class, gender gaps, and higher education in um, New Mexico, and the result that I wanted to show you was one that looked at the odds of graduating. These are all um, New Mexico high school graduates, and they are, um, it, it involved nine years of institutional data looking at who's predicted to graduate when we compare everyone to high income white women. And of course, if this were a salary study, we'd be using white men as the reference group, but this is um, educational attainment. And the first thing that uh, we did was organize from the group that had the highest disparity to the groups that had zero disparities. Zero disparities were um, Asian high income and Hispanic high income women. No difference. Their odds of graduating within six years at this public university that will remain nameless, <laughs> according to IRB, that they had no difference. Now, should we make the um, assumption that their experiences are identical? No. Intersectional analysis does not endorse the idea because you haven't, your lived experiences might have been very different. You might still have a, the same outcome. American Indian uh, high income women also had a very low disparity. They did have a disparity, but it was in the single digits. Low income white women had a disparity, but it was next to the lowest. Low income Asian women also. It was like 13 or 14% less likely. It's still a disparity, but it certainly wasn't as high. Why does this matter? Because right now, our funding formula for institutions of higher ed assumes that Pell status as a proxy for income is capturing at risk, right, race, gender, gap. So the absence of intersectional data is actually impeding our ability to document whether there's an inequity that exists and how to solve that, how to close those equity gaps, right? I want to call your attention to the odds of graduating for American Indian low-income men. 45% less likely to graduate than high-income white women. Their high-income brothers or cousins were 37% less likely. Still outrageous. White low-income men and high-income black men had the same odds of graduating. Horrible. 30% less likely. So what does this mean? Intersectionality would say the question is now, what's more important, class or race or gender? No. 
intersectionality would say, what is the complex inequality that is happening in this particular place at this particular time? And the reason we excluded anyone who came from out of state is because we were assuming the social determinants of educational opportunity structures are probably going to be radically different if you came from another state. We still want to collect that data. Now, the good news is through the Institute for the Study of Race and Social Justice and the New Mexico Race, Gender, Class Data Policy Consortium, we are now collecting systematic data on parental educational attainment because we were limited in our sample because only 42% of students fill out the FAFSA, and that's the only way we would get income. And it's going to be impossible to get income from every single student. Even if we had you know, the ability, it would be very difficult. But parental educational attainment is a data point that we feel pretty confident could give us very robust data for understanding complex inequality. So we, in sociology, and I know in a lot of fields, we'll talk about social locations. That's the idea that we are looking at particular social locations in a particular context. And again, the, this was about 6,400 um, students in the sample. And um, you know, the other comment that I'll make is, if we had data on street race for Hispanics or any of, any of these groups, it would apply to any group of color, then we might find differences in those who may be mixed race, but walking down the street, most people would assume they're white in terms of graduation. We don't have that. I mean, we don't currently collect data that way. We do have two separate questions, but there is no brown category, which is probably the experience of most of the um, Latinos on, on campus. So here's just a little slide on the consortium and how our hope is to really create a community of practice, an invitation for everyone to embrace this complexity instead of saying, no, it's too complicated, we'll just look at gender. No, it's too complicated, we're just going to look at class. No, it's too complicated, we're just going to look at race. We need to look at all those things together and um, hopefully develop our intersectional lens I say Latinx communities because I speak a lot about that. That's my expertise. But in all communities, it applies to Native, Asian, white communities as well, right? Um, via intersectional inquiry and practice for not only the complete camp, but for our research, our teaching, our research proposals, et cetera, et cetera. I have a lot of, as a qualitative researcher, and I want to be clear, I have a lot of data in the schools mostly um, looking at intersectionality from a qualitative lens, including um, and I'll just share a picture of uh, my, my book, um, Hopeful Girls, Troubled Boys, which right now has 766 citations. So I guess it's being used in the schools or something. Maybe it's being used to train teachers that looks at on the ground and also through people's lived experiences, um, what, what does intersectional analysis look like? Uh, so yeah, I will end it there and hopefully have a really good conversation with you about how, if at all, this could shape your next research proposal, having an intersectional understanding and lens and being self-critical, implicating yourself in systems of inequality. I didn't create, you know, heterosexism, but I benefit from it, right? I didn't create ableism, but I benefit from that, right? Um, I didn't create uh, cisgender systems that, um, would not put me in the same kind of experience that a transgender cousin or colleague would experience, or a LGBT colleague, or, but I'm implicated in that system. And that's the level of self-reflexivity that I invite all of you to engage in, even if it's uncomfortable. Thank you. <laughs>